Luke chapter 9, we're going to start verse 57. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter. It says this, it says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, if you're, a, if you're a salesman and, and, and you, you look at those passages, you, you would say, Jesus, you need to really, really work on your sales pitch there. I mean, there's three would-be followers who seem like they're ready, to, they're ready to close the deal, and Jesus seems to kind of miss the opportunity here. In fact, if, if you listen to him, he seems to be sort of doing the opposite of closing the deal, but almost telling them, you know, I don't know that if you want to do this. And, and he's, he's telling them, that what, they're, what they want to do or what they, they seem eager to do, that it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult. And normally, you don't do that. In sales, you're not, you're not talking about all the, all the negative stuff. You're not talking about all the, uh, just the, the bad stuff that no one wants to hear. You're, you're kind of talking about the benefits. You're talking about the perks. You're talking about all the great things that you'll experience, what you'll see, and, and how wonderful it's going to be. When you're buying a car, you don't immediately start with, with the salesman. You don't immediately start working through the numbers. No, what you start doing is he or she's going to show you the car. They're going to show you all the bells and whistles, the navigation, the automatic this, and now cars you can, you can get all they, they, They're their own Wi-Fi hotspots now, and they'll let you take a test drive. And, you know, hey, go ahead and, and go fast and, and, and do a lot of They're going to show you all of that stuff. And the point is, is they want, you to, they want you to focus on all the good about the car so that hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll want to buy it. And, and you'll, you'll become what, instead of a, a would-be buyer of the car, to you're, you're, ready to, you're ready to sign on the dotted line. And so they're just, they're just going to feed you with all the, all the good stuff. They're not going to tell you, well, it doesn't get that great gas mileage, or, you know, as soon as the warranty goes out, everything's going to break on the car. And all, they, they don't do that. They're, they're really trying to sell you. They want to they get you, and they want to pull you in, because they want you to say yes. But Jesus... Well, these three guys, he, he doesn't do that. He doesn't have any uh, pictures or brochures. He, he doesn't say, hey, come take a test drive. He, he, he really just kind of says, he comes right out and says, if, if you follow me, here's what it's going to cost you. And today and, and also next Sunday, uh, it's, it's really kind of one big sermon. Uh, but, but for your sake, uh, I've split it up into two, so we won't be here all day long. And th this week, we're going to be talking, we're going to be asking some tough questions uh, about what it means to follow Jesus. And then the next week, we're going we're gonna to talk about, okay, so if you answer yes to these questions, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? What does it mean for you and me? So don't miss next week, because you're only going to get half the sermon this week. So you have to be here for both. But back to today. Why do you think Jesus would come so strong at these would-be followers? Why would he not focus on the positives or, or, or the blessings of following him? But I, I think we can find at least part of the answer in verse 51 there of chapter 9. Um, we, we started in verse 57, but if you go back to verse 51, it says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to die. He was, going, he was going to the cross. In the Greek, that phrase, set his face, it speaks of, of this firm, unshakable resolve to do something. In other words, this, 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 was, this had kind of become Jesus' whole, this was, but this was his whole focus. Jesus always knew what was before him. He knew the cross was coming, but I think now, probably, possibly more than ever, the weight of the cross was growing heavier and heavier with each step. The Bible says that he had set his face towards Jerusalem. Jesus was well aware of the cost of forgiveness, and he was emphasizing that cost to these would-be followers. And now these guys, they, they, seem, they seem like they're ready. 
I mean, the first guy, he comes to Jesus and he says, I'll follow you wherever, wherever you go. And that phrase is more, it's not just about physically following him, but it, it also has the connotation of I'll go wherever you go and, and I'm willing to pay the price. And the second guy, he's, he's approached by Jesus and he was told to follow him. This guy says, I'm, I'm with you, Jesus, but l- let, me, let, me take care of, let me take care of my dad. Uh, the third guy comes and, and he, pro- he approaches Jesus. And like the first guy, he says, I, I, I'll follow you, but just let me, let me go to my family and let me, let me say goodbye. I, I'll, I'll be right with you. Now, I look at those three guys, and, and they all three seem like reasonable, genuine guys who, who are obviously, they're, they're with Jesus. I mean, they're, they're, they're with him because they're talking to him. I mean, they're, they're, they're a part of, part of the entourage that Jesus has going, but they're not followers they're not followers yet. They haven't crossed the line from would-be to follower. They seem eager. It, well, it, at least two of them do. I don't know about the, the second one. I, I don't know why Jesus chose to approach him. But the, the first two most definitely come, come to Jesus and say, we'll, we'll follow you. And Jesus picks out this, the, the one in the middle. But in my mind, I would think Jesus would tell these guys, awesome. You guys want to follow me? I'm looking for followers do, you do, what, do what you need to do, take care of that business that you need to take care of, and then come follow me. I'm, I'm headed to Jerusalem. But he doesn't. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't give any encouragement. He doesn't give them some kind of attaboys. He doesn't say, man, when you do this, you're, you're going to experience some incredible stuff. Matter of fact, ask my, ask my disciples. They've seen some amazing... He doesn't do any of that stuff. He gives them the really hard truth. Now, to the first guy, and we're going to kind of follow these along in, in your outline there. The first guy who comes up to him, Jesus immediately, he goes after his comfort. And this is the first question that, that all would-be followers, we, we have to ask ourselves. And the question is this, is will you choose to live Jesus' way? Will you choose to live Jesus' way? And the key word there is sacrifice. Look at verse 58 again. Jesus responds to him. He says, I'll go wherever you go. Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So when you, you, think, about, you think about home, uh, for most people, home is, is a place of comfort, it's a, place of, it's a place of security. It's, it's yours. It's your home. You don't, you don't really feel like you're at home when you're at a hotel. You don't really feel like you're at home when you're at someone else's house. Matter of fact, when we, our family was on vacation just a couple of weeks ago, you, we went online and we found a house where we wanted to stay. And, and we stayed there. And it, was, it was a great house, wonderful house. But, I mean, it wasn't ours. And so we, we, we kind of relaxed there. But, you know, you're still, you're real careful because... The stuff, it's, it's just not your stuff. It's not what, it, it doesn't belong to you. So you don't, you don't feel that way. It's just different. Home has your touch on it. It's your, your decorations. The, you know, the chair has, the, the lazy boy has your imprint on it. It's, it it's, it's your bed. You don't sleep as good as you do normally when you're not in, in, in your own bed. It's a place to come and just relax, to feel at peace. It's home. It's comfortable. And Jesus said, if you follow me, you have to be willing to leave all of that behind. You see, Jesus went after this guy's comfort. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is calling all of us to homelessness, to give up our homes. He might be. I don't know. I'm not God. He may be asking you to do that. But for a majority of us, we stay on the would-be side of things, and we don't cross the line because we're not willing to make sacrifices. And if we were, just, if we were flat out honest... We don't want to live the way that Jesus wants us to live. We don't want to do that. Why? Because it's hard. It's hard. If it wasn't hard, more people would do it. Everyone would do it. But, we, but we're, we're people of comfort. We're, we're, people, we're, we're about making life more convenient, making life easier, making life more comfortable. I mean, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole industry out there about making life easy. That's just kind of every, everything that, that, you know, we want to make your phone a lot easier. We want to make your car a lot easier. We want to make your computer a lot easier. We want to make, we want to make life simpler. We want to make it easier for you. We want it to make it more comfortable. We want you to enjoy the experience. We want life to be convenient. No one, no one wants to make life harder. 
But if you look at Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And we hear the word cross, and, and for us now in 2017, cross is, is a pretty tame word. It doesn't, it doesn't really pack a punch to us much anymore. But when the disciples and the other people who are, who are listening here to him, when they heard that, their reaction would be completely different than our reaction is. I mean, we read that word, take up, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, and it just kind of just rolls, rolls right out of our mouth. But there was nothing tame about the cross for these people. And for Jesus to say, take up your cross, that would seem extreme, and it would be associated with death, because the cross was a Roman form of execution. It was a Roman form of punishment. When you when you did a crime, okay, you, you had to do the time, and how you did the time for a lot of them was you were executed on the cross. It was, it was a public humiliation. It was torture. And so to hear Jesus say, take up your cross, that, that would freak out a lot of followers, especially would-be followers. And that's basically what Jesus, he's telling them to die, and he's also telling us to die. In order to follow me, you must be willing to die. Die to, die to your plans, to your agenda, die to your priorities, to your will, to your comfort, to your calendar, to it all. You have to be willing to die to it all. Jesus knew what the cross meant for him, but he also knew what it meant for us. He knew his death would give us life, but it was also a picture of obedience to his Father's will. The cross and resurrection made forgiveness possible, but the cross was also an example of what it means to follow God. Following means choosing God's way over our way. Following means sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, it says, Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Now, did, did you see that? I, I want to read this last part again to you. It says, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will what? What? No longer live for themselves. He died so that so those who receive new life will no longer live to themselves. It's, in other words, no longer live for, for what's comfortable, for what's easy, for that path of least resistance. Instead, instead of living for ourselves, what God calls us to do is to live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So, so Jimmy, what I hear you saying is, is that I can't, I can't really live for myself anymore. Is that right? Well, not if you want to be a follower of Christ. Not if you want to live in obedience not if you want to be in God's will. Not if you want to produce eternal fruit. See, when it comes to being a follower of Christ, there really is only one way. There's no sugarcoating it. And Jesus didn't sugarcoat it for this guy either. He said, listen, you, you said you want to follow me everywhere that I go. You're willing to do that? Well, let me let you know what that's going to cost you is that's going to cost you your comfort. It's going to require sacrifice. Are you still in? Let's look at his response to the second guy. The second guy, he went, with the first guy, he went after right after his comfort. With this guy, he's going right after his agenda. And this is the second question that all would-be followers that we have to ask ourselves is, will you change your priorities? Will you change your priorities? And the key word there is transformation. Look at verse 59 again. It says, to another, he says to the second guy, he said, follow me. But this guy responded, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, this guy, obviously, he loves, he loves his dad. And it sounds like he's doing uh, the, the responsible thing. In fact, Jesus' answer seems kind of harsh because Jesus says, hey, leave the dead to bury their own dead. This guy says, well, let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, hey, let, let the dead bury their, bury their own dead. So it, it, it seems kind of harsh the way that Jesus is answering this guy, but but here's what you need to understand. Jesus isn't asking this guy to ignore his sick father or, or not to, to attend his funeral. This, this is not what, what's going on here. In fact, if this guy's father was that close to dying or, or had already died, scholars say that this guy, he, he wouldn't be with Jesus. He would be home with his father. Jesus is not, is not asking this guy to break a commandment, to, to not honor his father. Uh, scholars, and, and, and you read in commentaries, it's basically what this man is saying is, 
kind of let, you know what, my dad is getting up in age, he's getting older, and, and, and so once he passes away, then, then what that I, I'll receive his inheritance, and then it will, it will probably be a little bit more financially feasible for me to go with you. Then, then it, things will have lined up. That it, it, basically, this guy's saying, I, I think right now the timing is, it's, it's just not right, Jesus. It's, it's just not right. When things are settled at home, then, then, then I'm good. When, when the kids go, when, when things settle down at work because I'm crazy busy, then maybe. Or when the kids go off to college, or, or, or Jesus, when our lives settle down. Really, Jesus, I, I want to follow you. I really do. My, my heart is right there. I, I, I would follow you, but right now, life is it's just a little hectic for me. But here's the translation. Here's what, here's what that guy's saying. Here's what we say. Translation, I've got more important things to take care of. I've got more important things to take care of. Romans 12, 2 says, don't change yourselves to be like the people of this world, but let God change you inside with a new way of thinking. Then you'll be able to understand and accept what God wants for you. You will be able to know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. You see, the whole idea is that when Jesus comes into your life, that he transforms how you live. It completely changes, changes you. And I think too many of us, me included sometimes, I think too many of us, we look like the rest of the world. We look like everyone else. Now, I don't mean that we need to, we need to change our clothing and, and look like, you know, just freaks or, or, or weirdos out there. But let me ask you this. But what separates believers from the rest of the world? What does, what does real change look for Christ? What does it look like for Christ followers? What does it mean for God to transform us? And I really think it starts with our priorities. What we value the most, you've heard this over and over from this pulpit before. Uh, you, you've heard our pastor say this over and over. What we value the most ends up on our calendar. If it's important, if it's important, if it's important, it gets calendar. Now, I, I, I can hear some of the pushback, and, and, and I know because I live in this world too. I don't live apart from this world. I'm, I'm in this world, and I get it. And, and, and I hear some people maybe arguing in their head, but it's, it's all important. It's all important. My work, my, 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 my family, the, the kids' activities, these things that we've got going on, all of this stuff in our... Jimmy, it's all important. And what I would say to you... And what I have to say to myself, too, is, do we trust Jesus? Do we trust him? Are we willing to let Jesus reorder our life? Now, for, for some of you uh, to, to, in your homes, if, if you just let someone kind of walk in and just start moving things around, I mean, some of you guys would go into full-blown panic attack. You couldn't handle it. No, wait, that doesn't go there. No, that's not why. That doesn't turn that way. No, wait, that doesn't look right. Oh, that picture, no, that doesn't go. No, that's not. Okay. But what we're saying as a follower of Jesus and what Jesus is telling us is he's saying, listen, will you allow me to come in and reorder things? Reorder your priorities. Are you willing to give him a clean calendar? Are you willing to let him to start setting your priorities? In other words, are, are you willing to let him be the foundation and you build your priorities on top, of, on top of that foundation based on what he says is important, based on what he says is true, based on what he says that we should value? Here's the deal. If it squeezes out God, if it squeezes out God and his will for your life, it's not that important. Let me say that again, okay? If what's on your calendar, if what you prioritize, if it pushes out God, if it squeezes out God and his will for your life, it is not that important. Nothing is more important than God's plan and direction for your life. Ephesians 4, 22 and through 24 says, so get rid of your old self, which made you live as you used to. The old self that was being destroyed by its deceitful desires. Your hearts and minds must be made completely new. And you must put on the new self, which is created in God's likeness and reveals itself in the true life that is upright and holy. You see, Jesus didn't die so that you and I could stay the same. Jesus didn't die so that we could just continue to live our lives and just go, you know, Jesus, thank you for that cross. Man, that was... 
That was incredible. High five, you know, fist bump. Okay, God, now I'm going to go do my thing. That's not why he died. He came to give us purpose and mission. You see what he told the second guy? He, he, he told him exactly what he, he was supposed to do and what we're called to do. He said, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This guy said, let me, let, me, let, me, let me go take care of these priorities. Let me go take care of these things that are more important to me right now. But Jesus says, listen, you need to let go of that, and you need to go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That is your, that is your purpose. That is, we need to let God transform us. You die to your agenda, you die to your priorities, and you use your God, ta God-given talents, your gifts, your resources, your abilities, and you proclaim the kingdom of God. And basically what Jesus was asking this guy and what he's asking you is me is he's saying, who's first? Who's first? Because if you say, Jesus, I need, I, the timing's just not right. I need, I need to go take care of this. Guess what? Jesus isn't first. But you don't you understand. This is, this, is, this is really important. I mean, this, this, is it more important than God? Well, that's easy for you to say, Jimmy, you're up there on the pulpit and you're, you're, you're talking about this. You don't know what, what I'm going through. You're right, I don't know what you're going through. But I live in the same world that you live and I, I go through some of the same temptations that you go through. I, I, I'm part of all the struggles that you go, that some of you guys go through as well. But more important than that, God knows exactly what you're going through. And Jesus says, let me prioritize your life. And if you trust me, then, then we'll take care of things. Things will work out. Who's first? Let's look at the, how he responds to the third guy, to this last guy. So he, for the first guy, he went after his comfort, okay? The second guy, he went after his, his, uh, his agenda. And to this third guy, Jesus goes right after his commitment. And this is the third question that all would-be followers, we have to ask ourselves is, will you cherish Jesus above all things? And the key word there is Perseverance. If you look at uh, verse 61, it says, Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And then Jesus told him, he said, No one who, who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you know anything about farming in, 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 in New Testament times, I mean, you, you had your beast up front of you, and you, you had, it was, had it rained, and it was pulling your plow and so you, there, it took a lot of strength. It took a lot of effort to keep that plow going, right, to keep it. But not only going, helping forward and guide it, but just to keep it straight. And, and what Jesus is saying, listen, if, if, you're, if you're plowing and you're busy looking back or you're busy getting distracted, he says, listen, that's, you, can't, you can't do that. Because, you know, if you get distracted, then guess what? You're not guiding uh, the plow how it should go and you're going to have crooked rows or you may actually run into something that you've already planted and destroy the crops that's something that you've already done and so Jesus is reminding us he's saying listen you have to cherish you have to cherish me above all things and for those of you who are married what happens when your spouse has a wandering eye <laughs> it ain't good is it it's, it's, it's not good. Why is, why is the wandering eye a problem? Well, it's, it's a problem because they're not focused on you. They're not focused on that relationship. You're, you are supposed to be the love of their life. You are supposed to be kind of the, the, the center of their world. Their, their eyes should be locked on you and nobody else. A wandering eye could probably get you a black eye. I'm, I'm, that's just a joke. I'm joking, of course. But you get the idea. Relationships don't work our marriages don't work when your husband or your wife, when you're together, but they're constantly over here looking and kind of checking other people out or checking other, and it just, your focus, your attention is supposed to be on that. And in the marriage vows, you might hear the word cherish used when, when husbands uh, and wives are making a promise to one another. And the whole idea about cherishing is, is that this idea means is that nothing will come between the two of you. You won't have to compete. You're saying to your wife or you're saying to your husband, you're not going to have to compete for my attention. You're not going to have to wonder if I love you. You're not going to have to wonder if I'm going to be there for you. If, if um, I'm all yours, I will cherish you above all others. And here's the second part of that promise. I will cherish you above all others, and it will always be that way. And so Jesus was asking this guy, Will you cherish me? 
Will you always cherish this relationship? Jesus wanted this guy to understand that all other relationships have to take a back seat to our relationship with him. All relationships. Well, that sounds awfully arrogant and selfish of Jesus. Well, <laughs> he's God. He's God. It's not arrogant because he created us. He died for us. The Bible tells us that we belong to him, that we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And yes, it's selfish, but it's not selfish like you think about. It's selfish in the sense that God knows the consequences to us when we cherish something or someone over him. And those consequences are never, ever good. God, like the good father that he is, knows what happens to us he, he sees it. He knows what happens when we allow anything or anyone to take his rightful place in our lives. That's, that's, that's the jealousy that talks about. God knows what is best for us. God knows what is good for us. He created us. He knows that, that he is the best for us. And he is, he is the life giver. And he is, he is our all. He knows that. But when God sees us choosing something other than what is best, and when you choose something other than God, then you are choosing something other than what is best for you. And he becomes jealous for that because he knows how we will be hurt. He knows how we will be disappointed. He knows how we will, we will be in shame over our decisions. He knows that it is not good for us. God and God alone is concerned about our ultimate good. And it's not just a concern for the present, for here and now, but it's also a concern he has for our future. Satan, devil, the enemy, whatever you want to call him, the Bible says he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's the whole purpose of his, his existence. And when we cherish something or someone other than God, we are giving Satan a foothold in our lives. And we're giving him the opportunity to kind of wedge himself in between us and God. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's two key phrases there that I want to focus on really quick, and the first one is throw off, and the second one is fix our eyes. Why throw it off? Because all it does, all it does is it brings you down. When you run a race, you don't want anything to be slowing you down. Some of you uh, run in 5Ks or you do marathons or you do triathlons. And one of the things, the only thing you're working on is speed, speed, speed. You want to get finished. You want to get done as fast as you can. And you're not carrying a lot of extra stuff. You're not carrying a lot of extra junk because you know it slows you down. The less you have, the less you weigh, the faster you go. You watch Olympic runners. I mean, they, they, they just have just basic gear on. And even now, swimmers, they have these, these speed suits that, that help them to go faster through the water. The whole point is speed. It's this whole idea that you don't want anything to encumber you, anything to slow you down. And the writer of Hebrews says we need to get rid of anything, anything that will keep us from running towards God. He is the goal. He is the prize. And anything that, that's still on us, that's, it's, it's something that we're choosing to cherish above God. Satan, he, he, want, he wants you to bog down. He wants to kind of come in between you and God. He wants you to look and focus on other stuff. He's pointing you over there. Look at that. Doesn't that look good? Look at that. Run that race. That race is a whole lot easier. That race costs a whole lot less. That race will, will help you to stay. You can stay comfortable and run that race. You can do all of those things. He wants to bog you down. He wants to distract you. He wants you to run a different race. He doesn't want you. He wants you to do you. You focus on you. You do what feels comfortable to you. You, what, you know, what feels right. Man, you, you just do you. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the finish line. That line's not going anywhere. You just, you just, just kind of do what you want to do. You go when you're ready. But Jesus says that, the writer of Hebrews says that we need to, we need to throw off all the things that encumber us, that slow us down. And it says to fix our eyes on Jesus. In that Greek, that, that phrase literally means to turn your eyes away from other things and fix it on one thing. Back to that whole idea about the plow. You know, you don't plow and look back. You're just focused on the line that, that, that you're plowing, where you're going. And Jesus, in Hebrews, the writer says to fix your eyes. So stop looking at something else and focus on one thing and one thing only. And, the, and this writer of Hebrews tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. It's a term of focus, and it's a term of attention. 
Nothing is going to distract you. And that takes discipline, especially in a world that's doing everything in its power to distract you, to distract you from God's design for your life. Runners look at one thing and one thing only when they're running. They're looking at the finish line. Unless you're Usain Bolt, you're typically, you're not, you're not looking around, you know, just checking out your competition. Why? Because it'll slow you down. And if you're not careful, it could cause you to drift and, and get out of your lane. You're single-minded and focused. That's it. That's what Jesus is telling this third guy. He's saying no matter how good it is, nothing is better than God. You need to cherish Him. 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12 says, But you belong to God, so you should stay away from all those things. Always try to do what is right to be devoted to God, to have faith, love, patience, and gentleness. We have to fight to keep our faith. Try as hard as you can to win that fight. Take hold of eternal life. It is the life you were chosen to have when you confessed your faith in Jesus, that wonderful truth that you spoke so openly and that so many people heard. And you see that word there, it says always. That's an important word in this passage. Always try to do what is right to be devoted, to have faith, love, patience. It speaks to that commitment that we have with God. Obviously, the road Jesus was on was going to lead to pain. It was going to lead to betrayal. It was going to lead to humiliation, to loneliness, to abandonment. Jesus knew that, and yet he turned his face to Jerusalem. Jesus was willing to go where his father wanted him to go, no matter the cost. And Jesus wanted his followers and the would-be followers to understand this. Being a follower is not a temporary thing. It's a lifetime commitment. I know it doesn't always seem like this, but, but when, when a couple says, I do, it to each other, they're also, what they're really saying is, or what they should be saying is, I do, and I will keep on doing. No matter what. It's perseverance. It says, I'm I'm going to continue this relationship. We're going to fight through whatever obstacles come our way. I'm not going to, my eye is not going to be turned. I'm not going to get unfocused. I'm not going to, you know, get distracted by anything. But I do. I cherish you. That means that I cherish you above all others and nothing is going to come between it. And I'm going to persevere through this relationship because I know that this is what God has brought together. Paul told Timothy, we have to fight to keep the faith. We have to be willing to fight because there'll be times when we don't want to anymore. Jesus knew what the road ahead held for him, but he also knew what was after the cross. Hebrews said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He knew what was coming. We're going to actually talk about that next week. So Jesus didn't sugarcoat it for these guys, and he doesn't doesn't for us either. He wants us to know the cost to following him. Are you willing to take that first step to follow Jesus? Will you choose to live Jesus' way? Will you change your priorities? Will you cherish Jesus above all things? The difference between a would-be follower and an actual follower is how you answer those three questions. Will you choose to live his way? Will you change your priorities? Will you cherish him above all things? Jesus requires sacrifice. He wants to transform our lives. Jesus calls us to follow him no matter what. But let me tell you this, okay? If you say yes, you will never regret it. If you say, if you answer yes to those questions, you'll never forget it. There's a cost, okay? There's a cost to follow Jesus. We've talked about this this whole time, this whole series about follow. There's a cost to follow Jesus. But I'm going to close with this verse, and it's 1 Corinthians 2.9. If you don't have this highlight in your Bible, you need to. It says, but just as it is written, things that no eye has seen or ear has heard or mind imagined are the things that God has prepared for those who love him, for those who follow him, for those who say yes to him. No eye has seen or ear has heard or mind imagined are the things that God has prepared for his followers.